What is up, beloved? We are back for another episode. We are going to finish this fourth season of TPR with the topic that we started this season with, which is going to be speaking about the calendar. I'm going to readdress the calendar information and put a lot of information and points in this episode. I'm also going to be posting this episode to YouTube, Most High Willing, my YouTube channel, is at tprpod5, youtube.com slash at sign tprpod5 is how you find my YouTube channel. If you're listening to this on YouTube, the main platform that I post these episodes on is my podcast platform, which you can listen to on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, and a lot of other podcast platforms. The show is called TPR, the Positivity Report. There's going to be links in the YouTube video description. And if you're having trouble finding the podcast series itself, just drop a comment on the YouTube video and I will provide you a link and help you out. So I'm going to be referencing some other episodes of my podcast series, TPR, which are not posted to YouTube. And For those of you that are listening on the podcast platforms, we started this fourth season of TPR speaking about the calendar in a lot of different episodes. It was TPR 192, Every Saturday Ain't the Sabbath, TPR 193, Sunrise, TPR 194, The Moon, TPR 197, Sunrise Part 2, Important. And in that episode, we were speaking about Psalms 104.23, which we're going to get to in this episode as well. So pretty much the calendar that we've been on in the past year is Nick Vanderlane's Enoch Solar Calendar. Nick has a YouTube channel. His, his channel is Nick Vanderlane. And he has a playlist on his YouTube channel called Official Enoch Calendar. That's how you can really learn about the Enoch solar calendar. He has an entire playlist, the official Enoch calendar playlist. So watch those videos and learn it for yourself. And I'm going to put a good amount of points in this episode so you can hear me explain it. But the person I learned it from is from Nick Vanderlane. So check out his playlist, official Enoch calendar on his YouTube channel, Nick Vanderlane. You can also go to his website, which is enochcalendar.com. And on his website, enochcalendar.com, there's a lot of different formats that you can look at the calendar. And he even has a spreadsheet of the calendars from 2019 to 2029. A lot of the future calendars all in one spreadsheet. That's enochcalendar.com. His YouTube channel is Nick Vanderlane, and he has the official Enoch Calendar playlist. Another playlist that you should look into is restored covenant of noah removing blood from meat and eating only boiled flesh that is also a playlist on nick's channel and that's really important and something that we spoke about on this series in tpr 195 noah's covenant i personally believe that and this is what nick is restoring in that covenant of noah is Part of the covenant of Noah is not eating flesh with the blood, which we're also going to get to in a few different scriptures in this episode, one of them being in Jubilee 6, where at the end of that prophecy it says, and they will eat all kinds of blood with all kinds of flesh. I personally believe that a lot of the flesh and meat that people are eating still has blood in it, and there's only one biblical way to cook flesh to eat which is eating boiled flesh so you can learn about that in tpr 195 noah's covenant and go directly to the playlist on nick vanderlane's youtube channel restored covenant of noah removing blood from meat and eating only boiled flesh we're going to cover more of that in this episode as well so a quick story time of why i'm even recording this episode so at the very start of the season at the start of the year I spoke about in those episodes me being on Nick Vanderlane's Enoch Solar Calendar. And at the time, me and Larry Johnson were both on this calendar for several months. You can hear my episode, the interview I did with Larry Johnson, posted to YouTube and on this podcast series, TPR 225, Larry Johnson, the full interview with LJ. Me and him were both on this calendar for several months. And then just a few months ago, Larry came out saying that he changed the calendar to become Set Apart's calendar, which we're going to speak about in this episode as well, kind of debunking and and 
disputing a lot of the points that he puts in his YouTube video. So Larry has now switched to become set apart's calendar. You can go to his YouTube channel, become set apart and see the video that he did on the calendar path of righteousness, Sabbaths, feast days, and new moons. And we will be addressing this heavily later on in this episode, giving a lot of points on his video that's become set apart's YouTube channel. So as far as all these points, we have to be looking into these matters for ourselves. You can't just listen to doing whatever Larry's doing or doing whatever I'm doing. You have to learn about the calendar for yourself. So the calendar I'm on is Nick Vanderlane on YouTube. You can also see where Larry switched to become set apart's calendar. So those are the two the two channels to learn about the calendar for yourself, Nick Vanderlane and become set apart, the two different YouTube channels. And I'm going to be showing why I believe Nick Vanderlane's calendar is correct and why I believe Become Set Apart's calendar is not correct. And before we get to that, I will pretty much just summarize as best I can a lot of the information about Nick's Enoch calendar and provide a lot of the points uh, from those previous episodes that I did at the start of this season now that I have a better understanding. That's what I realized after re-looking into this is that in the past year, I actually have a lot better understanding about the calendar that I thought I understood it pretty well, but I actually realized I have a lot better understanding now, glory to the most high, a year later. And same thing even with that Noah's covenant. When I did TPR 195 Noah's covenant, I was just thinking, oh yeah, it's definitely possible that there's still blood in flesh that people are eating, breaking Noah's everlasting covenant between us and the most high, every living creature on earth. And the Most High, even people who don't believe in the Most High, we're all, every creature on this earth is a part of Noah's everlasting covenant. And that's what I realized as I was re-looking into this is that now I actually believe more that there is still blood in flesh and people are breaking Noah's everlasting covenant. And same thing with the calendar, glory to the Most High. I feel like I've gotten a lot more understanding and now about a year later I have more understanding than when I first switched to the Enoch solar calendar, which we're going to get to. So just some of the most basic rules about the Enoch solar calendar is it's obviously a 364 day calendar. And there's many scriptures confirming and reiterating how it's a 364 day calendar. We're going to get to some of those scriptures in this episode as well. And the calendar starts the day after the spring equinox. So the spring equinox is the great sign on earth in Jubilees 2-9. And you need that entire day of the spring equinox to confirm that it was, in fact, the equinox, um, you know, without having technology to tell us because in ancient times they were doing it without technology. So you use the entire day of the sun the great sign on earth which is the spring equinox to confirm yes this was the spring equinox and then the day after that starts day one of the first month starting the calendar now the reason why the spring equinox is not part of the 364 day calendar year is because it is speculated that this is the cursed day of job's birth so the most high had that day removed thus the calendar is 364 days and the spring equinox is the great sign on earth so it's speculated that Job was actually born on the spring equinox and in the book of Job when he cursed the day of his birth that's why that day is not a part of the 364 day calendar year and so the months on the calendar follow this format 30 days 30 days 31 days 30 days 30 days 31 days and when you follow that format 30 days 30 days 31 days four times it equals 364 days completing the year perfectly and the new month festival which is commonly misunderstood as new moon festival which we're going to get to heavily but the new month of the first month the fourth month the seventh month the tenth month those are the days of the seasons and we're going to get to that in jubilee six as well so the first day of each month is a new month festival and then the first day of the first month the fourth month the seventh month the tenth month those are the special new moon festivals special new month festivals to note the seasons and they are memorial days of remembrance made by noah and jubilee six for the four seasons of the year more on this later on and so as we're going to see when scripture says a new moon it should really be translated better translated as a new month the Hebrew word for new month is Rosh Kodesh, 
and the Hebrew word for moon is Yurek. And I'm also going to be playing some excerpts and some clips from some of Nick Vanderlane's videos, which help, which will help explain some of these points a little bit more. The new months, Rosh Hodesh, not moons. In the video, I expose the lying scribes' agenda to replace new month, Rosh Hodesh, with new moon. Yurek is the Hebrew name for moon. The new month, Rosh. Hodesh, not moon. Moon is Yurek. And so when you go to the Strong's H2320 for Kodesh, Rosh Kodesh, new month, it gives an outline of biblical usage. It says the first day of the month, month, monthly, or new moon. And when you look at the King James translation count, it's used 276 times in the King James, and 254 of those times it was used for month not moon or not new moon kodesh was used 276 times in the king james and 254 of those times it was used for month and only 20 times for new moon so literally 254 out of 276 times it was used for month so rosh kodesh new month not new moon so where scripture says new moon it should really say new month so it's the new month festivals not new moon festivals and we're going to get to that further and again the word for moon is yurek where new month is rosh kodesh they're different words in the hebrew the new months rosh kodesh not moons in the video i expose the lying scribes agenda to replace new month rosh kodesh with new moon yurek is the hebrew name for moon the new month rosh Hodesh, not moon. Moon is Yurek. And so you might be wondering, well, if it's an Enoch solar calendar, what is the moon for? The moon is for signs, like, for example, a blood moon. And it's also a timepiece for us to use. There's going to be a lot more on this later when we get to become set apart's vid as his calendar is lunar based so we'll focus more on the moon and exposing what it's really for and how it's not used for Sabbaths. And most importantly, in Enoch 80, in line 3, it says, In the days of sinners, the years shall be shortened. And then later on in that passage, around line 6, also speaking about the days of sinners, which we are in the days of sinners right now, the end times, it says how the moon shall change its laws and not be seen at its proper period. And then in Isaiah 24, it speaks about how the moon is going to be confounded, which means confused. So these are big indicators of why we are not supposed to use the moon for Sabbaths, because in the end times, in the days of sinners, the moon is going to be confounded or confused, and it's going to change its laws and not be seen at its proper period. And I also have another additional scripture that we're going to get to as well, showing a similar point. Now, to get back to the Sabbath on the solar Enoch calendar, the day after the spring equinox is the first day of the first month. But that resets to the fourth day of the week. Why? Because the sun and moon were created on day four of creation week. So the day after the spring equinox is the first day of the first month, but it's the fourth day of the week. It resets after the spring equinox. And there's another way to confirm this as well is by counting backwards from Shavuot because we know what day of the week that feast day falls on. And then so you just count backwards to understand that the first day of the first month resets to the fourth day of the week. And here's another clip from Nick Vanderlane explaining this point. How do we know that the first day of the first month is the fourth day of the week? Because Jubilees gives us a pegged date for Shavuot as the 15th day of the third month, the Feast of Weeks. And we know from Leviticus that Shavuot is on the first day of the week. So all we have to do is count backward from the 15th day of the third month being the first day of the week. And when you do so, the first day of the first month is the fourth day of the week. Hallelujah. This is Shavuot Feast of Weeks. And Shavuot is pegged in Jubilees chapter 44 verse 4 to be the 15th day of the third month. And that date is also validated in the temple scroll of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so another way that the calendar and the Sabbaths work is that they keep the Sabbath in the heavens. So what we are doing is syncing up the Sabbath here on earth as it is done in heaven. And that's why 
in the Our Father prayer that the Messiah gave us in Matthew, it says, in earth as in the heavens. Let the Father's will be done in earth as in the heavens, because we are syncing up what's going on up in the heavens down here on earth. And then if you go to Jubilees chapter 2, around line 31, on this we kept Shabbat in the heavens before it was made known to any flesh to guard the Shabbat thereon on the earth. So they keep the Sabbath up in the heavens, and we are syncing up what's going on up in the heavens here on earth. Hallelujah. Now, the biblical day begins at sunrise. The false religion, the you-know-whos, the synagogue of Satan, they start in the evening and end in the evening, starting in the dark, ending in the dark, because they are a false religion of darkness. We are the children of the light, walking in the, walking in the light, living in the light, doing everything in the light. There's going to be more on this in a moment. The false religion, their false Saturday, or their false Sabbath is Saturday, which is like Saturn Day, Saturn worship, Saturn equals Satan. They're the synagogue of Satan. So when we all came into this truth, we all thought the Sabbath was Friday evening to Saturday evening. But that's just because the false religion, the you, you know who's, we were getting these false doctrines from them. And that's why when you finally get off the Gregorian calendar and when you finally get off the Saturday Sabbath, it's such a blessed feeling because we are not doing anything the same as the false religions they start their days in the evening evening to evening starting in the dark ending in the dark their darkness keeping their their shabbat on saturday saturn day saturn equals satan so once you come off that it's a beautiful thing glory to the most high and the true biblical days start at sunrise starting in the light so the false religion they start in the dark and end in the dark but the true biblical day starts at sunrise and the parts of a biblical day are the daytime from sunrise to sunset, the light period of the day, the daytime, then the evening, and then the nighttime. So it's day, evening, night is the parts of a biblical day. And then the following biblical day starts the following day at sunrise. And in Enoch, it actually lists that there's 18 parts of time per day. But just to keep it simple, it can be broken down into the day, the evening, and the night. So the biblical day starts at sunrise. Sunrise to sunset is the day, the light time period of the day. It transitions in the evening, and then it's the night time. And then the following biblical day starts the following day at sunrise. And so Nick Vanderlein has a video called Biblical Proof. The day starts at sunrise. There's another video in his calendar playlist, as well as many videos across YouTube explaining these points. There's ample scriptures to go through to realize this that the biblical day starts at sunrise but we're going to get to some of them in a moment but first the reason people incorrectly think all days start at evening is because of the high sabbaths or high days such as passover and day of atonement those are special days and high days so they have the special commandment to start them at evening but if every biblical day started at evening we wouldn't need those specific instructions telling us to start those days at evening because it would be known that we are starting at evening those are high sabbaths high days and also passover and day of atonement mirror each other that's why there's a special high day in the spring for passover and then a special high day in the fall for day of atonement we have passover followed by feast of unleavened bread in the spring then the day of atonement followed by feast of tabernacles in the fall these feasts and holy days mirror each other. That's why each season of feast in the fall and the spring both start with a high day first before the consecutive days of feasting. They mirror each other. Hallelujah. And another point I've explained on this series is I personally believe that the Messiah was born in the fall and then was crucified and resurrected in the spring around Passover. So I believe, again, that those two concepts mirror each other the Messiah was born in the fall, died in the spring, mirroring each other. And that's why in the fall, there is the Day of Atonement followed by Feast of Tabernacles. And then in, in the spring, there is Passover followed by Unleavened Bread, a high day followed by consecutive days of feast. They mirror each other. And that's exactly why people think all biblical days start in the evening. But the reason we have those specific instructions for starting the Passover in the evening and starting the Day of Atonement in, in the evening is because those are special days, high days. And if every day started at evening, then the Most High wouldn't give us those specific instructions saying start these days at evening because it would just be known that they're starting at evening. 
So those are special high days, and that's why they have those specific instructions telling us to start those days in the evening, but all the other biblical days start at sunrise. The biblical day starts at sunrise. Now also we are commanded to keep the Sabbath day. In scripture it only will ever say Sabbath or Sabbath day. There is never a Sabbath evening or Sabbath night. It's just Sabbath or Sabbath day. And in the Ten Commandments we are commanded to keep the Sabbath day. In Exodus 20 starting at line 8, remember the day of the Shabbat to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Shabbat of Yahuwah el Haka, in it you shall not do any work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, your manservant, nor your maidservant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger that is within your gates. For in six days Yahuwah made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore Yahuwah blessed the day of Shabbat and hallowed it. So you can see right here, remember the day of the Shabbat to keep it holy. And like I said, all throughout scripture, there's never a Sabbath evening or a Sabbath night. It's either just Sabbath or Sabbath day. And then just another side point as well, in the Larry Johnson episode, we spoke about the Ruach being descending upon Yahusha after his baptism, and it says like a dove. And if you search the scriptures for all the time dove is in there, it will either just say dove, or it'll say dove and refer to it as a her or a she. There is never a time where a dove is referred to as a he, or a him in the scriptures, it'll either just say dove or a dove as she or her, just like in in this as far as the Sabbath, it'll say Sabbath or Sabbath day. There's never a Sabbath evening or Sabbath night. And in scriptures, there's never a reference to a dove as a he or a him. It's either she, her, or just dove by itself. So those are interesting points to think about and understand that a lot not a lot of people know actually honestly and then in tpr 197 sunrise part two we heavily focused on the scripture in psalms 104 23 man goes forth unto his work and to his labor until the evening right this is why the sabbath day is special and holy because that is the time where we normally be working but instead we are home resting and then as far as the evenings and the nights, we're home resting during that time any day of the week. So we get the commandment to keep the Sabbath day. And then in Psalms 104.23, man goes forth unto his work and to his labor until the evening. So every single day of the week, we by the time the evening and the night comes, we are at home resting, not working. Why? Because we are to work until the evening man goes forth unto his work and to his labor until the evening so that means all six days of the week we work during the day and then by the evening and the night we're home resting that's why the sabbath day is special and holy because that's the one day during the week where during the day we're home resting and not working and that's why it says keep the sabbath day special and holy because Every day of the week, by the evening and the night, we're already at home resting, but the Sabbath day is the one time during the week where we would be working, but instead we are home resting and not working. That's why the Sabbath day is special and holy. So the Sabbath starts at sunrise, just like all the biblical days start at sunrise, and the Sabbath day is from sunrise to sunset, which we are commanded to keep. And then the evening and the night, we are still at home resting, and not working because we're already at home resting and we'd be doing that anyway any day of the week by evening and the night we're not working or and we are resting we're home not working so on a sabbath the sabbath day starts from sunrise to sunset that's the sabbath day and then we're already already at home not working and resting and we'd be doing that any day of the week so it's the Sabbath day that is holy. And we have to remember that the next biblical day hasn't started until the sun comes up the following day. So the Sabbath day is sunrise to sunset, the Sabbath day, and then for the evening and the night, we're already at home, we're already not working, we're already resting. And the next biblical day starts the following day at sunrise. So for me, like I'm already at home chilling and resting and winding down after the Sabbath day, during that evening and night, and then the following day starts the following day at sunrise. Now for some scriptures. John 11, 9, and 10. Yahusha answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbles not, because he sees the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbles, because there is no light in him. 
So again, the false religion, the synagogue of Satan, starting in the evening, starting in the dark, ending in the dark. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbles because there is no light in him. We're going to get to this further. And in line nine, Yahusha tells us that there's 12 hours in the day because that's the sunrise to sunset, the daytime hours of the day. All right. And then 1 John 1, 5 through 7. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that Elohim is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Yahushua HaMashiach, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Right? So how can the Most High Sabbath start in the dark, end in the dark, if Elohim is light and in him is no darkness at all? Meaning his Sabbath, the Sabbath day, has no darkness at all. The Sabbath day is what we're commanded to keep. Elohim is light and in him is no darkness at all. And as far as us walking in the light, that's why it... It makes more and more sense that it's an Enoch solar calendar doing everything in the light, everything in the day. Why is the Most High going to have us out there looking up at the moon every single night, walking in darkness, literally walking in the night, walking in darkness? We're going to get to those points further. But you'll start to see why it makes more and more sense that it's an Enoch solar calendar. And then John 8 and 12, Then spoke Yahushua again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And then here's a big one, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 5, Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Again, it's a solar calendar walking in the daytime we're the children of light and the children of the day we are not of the night nor of darkness so why would the most high have us out there staring up at the moon walking in night walking in darkness when we are the children of the day children of light we are not of the night nor of darkness we're going to get to this more and then another scripture psalms 113 line in three from the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same yahuwah's name is to be praised and then first john 5 and 3 for this is the love of elohim that we guard his commandments and his commandments are not grievous so this gives a whole new meaning to that scripture about his commandments not being grievous because before when we were keeping the evening to evening sabbath is 24 hour very long sabbath where now we see that the sabbath day sunrise to sunset is the sabbath day that we are commanded to keep and a great article is just a word.org slash when dash does dash the dash sabbath dash begin when does the sabbath begin from just a word.org i'll put that link in both the YouTube video description and this episode description on this podcast series, justaword.org, when does the Sabbath begin? A really uh, informative article to see a lot of scriptures as well about the biblical day starting at sunrise. All right, so now that we have explained a lot of the points and rules regarding Nick Vanderlane's Enoch solar calendar, now we are going to transition to exposing a lot of the problems with Become Set Apart's lunar calendar and showing why I think it's incorrect. So firstly, as far as any type of lunar calendar, something that sticks out to me incredibly and is a big red flag to me and very telling is that brothers who use a lunar calendar can't even agree on if it's a new moon, if, if a new moon is a full moon or a sliver of light. We heard earlier that new moon is actually translated as new month, but since brothers don't realize that, they debate back and forth incorrectly about whether a new moon is a full moon or a sliver of light. Both are actually incorrect. The scriptures should say new month, not new moon, like we heard earlier. And this is what I'm saying is this is a big red flag of people using the lunar calendars, lunar Sabbath. They can't even agree on whether it's a full moon or the sliver of moon. So that to me is very telling, honestly. And again, just the whole point of it is that's part of the deception is the Khazars, the people who were using lunar calendars, This deception is put forth so that we are wasting time every night staring up at the moon, trying to decipher the smallest moon phase changes every night and say, oh, is it the full moon? Is it a new moon? Is it a sliver of light? Instead of worshiping the most high in spirit and in truth and walking in the daytime, the Khazars and the lunar Sabbath calendar keepers 
have us out there trying to decipher the smallest, most minuscule changes of the moon phases instead of worshiping the most high. And that is why it's a deception. And that's why both are wrong. Whether you say it's a full moon or a sliver of light, it's neither. It's new month, not new moon. And also we heard earlier how we are the children of the light and we are not to be walking in darkness. So like I said before, so why would the Most High have us literally walking outside in darkness each night staring up at the moon, trying to recognize the slightest, smallest moon phase changes, trying to determine the correct days? Wouldn't he rather have us walking in light, seeking and worshiping the Most High in spirit and in truth, rather than wasting time every night walking in darkness, staring up at the moon? That's why it's a deception because we are the children of the daytime not of night we are not supposed to be walking in in darkness walking in the night and when you walk outside to look up at the moon to observe the moon that's literally and physically walking in darkness walking in the night when we are the children of the daytime and this is a reoccurring theme of us being in the light that's why it's a solar calendar being in the light and you shouldn't want to, honestly, the longer I've been on this calendar and just the more I'm in this truth, like, I actually don't like being out at night, like, like it, and especially now in the winter when it gets dark really early, like, if I'm still getting home in the evening and it's dark, like, I don't like being out at night. I, I like literally living in the day, getting up early and being home by the time it's dark and nighttime, not, not doing things in the night we shouldn't want to be out and about at night we shouldn't want to be out and out and about in the dark we shouldn't want to be walking outside every single night looking up at the moon in darkness that's not what the most high wants us doing honestly and that's why it's a deception having people wasting time staring up at the moon and we also are going to cover how the moon is going to change its laws in the days of sinners in the end times and not be seen at its proper period so People are out there staring at the moon, not even realizing that the moon is literally changing its laws. And in Isaiah 24, the moon is confounded, which we're going to get to a lot further. And again, a big red flag is that lunar Sabbath keepers can't even agree on whether it's a full moon or a sliver of light. For example, Become Set Apart is claiming that a full moon is the new moon, while many other brothers say it's a sliver of light. Both are incorrect. It's new month, not new moon, like we covered earlier. Now, two of the biggest pieces of evidence for this claim that both are incorrect is Enoch 80 and Isaiah 24. Like I said, in Enoch 80, line 3, it says, How in the days of sinners, which is the end times, the years shall be shortened, which is a prophecy that's already happening. Then in line 6 of the Sefer version, some translations, the chapters and, and numbers and lines are slightly off and changed, but... In line 6 of chapter 80 of Enoch and the Sefer, it says how the moon shall change its laws and not be seen at its proper period. So all the laws of the moon that we receive in Enoch 78 and just in Enoch chapter 70s, no matter what chapter it is, when it's going through the laws of the moon, that's exactly why after all of that, in, in the 70s and chapter 70s of Enoch, it gives the laws of the moon. And then after all of that, in Enoch 80, it says those laws are going to change. And I have not seen anyone who keeps a lunar Sabbath or a lunar calendar address Enoch 80 and the fact that the laws of the moon are changing and it's not going to be seen at its proper period. Nobody keeping lunar Sabbaths or calendars has addressed this that I've seen. And there's going to be more on this as well. Anyone who keeps a lunar calendar or lunar Sabbath, they only talk about Enoch 78, Enoch in the 70s, whatever chapter it is, talking about the laws of the moon, saying, oh, it's a full moon. Oh, it's a sliver of light. But none of them, I have not seen anyone address Enoch 80 where it says the moon is going to change its laws and not be seen at its proper period. And then in Isaiah 24, it says how the moon will be confounded, which means confused. So again, how can we be using the moon for Sabbaths and for months or for whatever if it's going to be confounded or confused and also change its laws and not be seen at its proper period? And then also in Isaiah 24, line 5, it says the earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the Torah, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. So what is the everlasting covenant? Noah's everlasting covenant not to eat flesh with the blood. Again, really look into Nick's playlist about understanding how there is still blood in this flesh that people are eating and there's one biblical way to remove blood from flesh, which is 
in Judges chapter 6, boiling the flesh and dumping out the water. And it also speaks about blood and flesh, I believe in Ezekiel, I think also chapter 24. But Isaiah 24 in line 5, the earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the Torah, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. And then when you scroll down to the end of Isaiah 24, in line 23, then the moon shall be confounded and the sun ashamed when Yahuwah of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his ancients gloriously. So the moon is going to be confounded or confused and the sun ashamed. Why? Because it says the day of Yahuwah is darkness, not light. So, and also as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be for the coming of the Son of Man. And when you read Jasher, which we covered on this series, TPR 209, Noah, the Nope movie, we read this scripture in Jasher about what happened in the days of Noah before the flood. And it said on that day, the sun turned to darkness because it's the day of darkness. And that's why it says the sun shall be ashamed and the moon confounded. Because the moon is going to be confused and the sun ashamed. It's a day of darkness. The day of Yahuwah is darkness, not light. Amos, Amos chapter 5, line 18. Woe unto you that desire at the day of Yahuwah. To what end is it for you? The day of Yahuwah is darkness and not light. And then line 20. Shall not the day of Yahuwah be darkness and not light? Even very dark and no brightness in it. And so to me, it's very interesting how Nick Vanderlane has a playlist on the Enoch calendar, and he also has restored the covenant of Noah, which is about not eating flesh with blood. And then in Isaiah 24, it's, it's connecting those two things about breaking the everlasting covenant and also speaking about the moon being confounded. So it's very interesting that those two concepts are connected in Isaiah 24 and it's the same exact thing in Jubilee 6 which we're going to get to how it says those who make observations of the moon are going to go astray and then the very last line says and they will eat all kinds of blood with all kinds of flesh so again in Isaiah 24 and in Jubilee 6 it's connecting the error of the moon and the error of eating flesh with the blood so in multiple scriptures, multiple prophecies, the error of eating flesh with the blood and the error of the moon are literally being connected in multiple prophecies, not by accident, purposely. All right, so we're going to get to that more in Jubilee 6. Now, some other big red flags with Become Set Apart's lunar calendar is that he adds a 13th month. Every three years on his calendar, he adds a 13th month. So we know the calendar is 364 days only. So how can we be adding a whole entire month every three years? That makes no sense and is a big red flag. On the contrary, on the Enoch solar calendar, the only day that's not being counted as part of the 364 days is the spring equinox, which is the great sign on Earth in Jubilees 2.9. And why? Again, because it's speculated that it's Job's cursed day of his birth, thus removed from the 364-day count. So on the Enoch solar calendar, it's one day for the spring equinox, the great sign on earth in Jubilees 2.9, and the supposed and probable cursed day of Job's birth, which makes a whole lot more sense than adding a whole entire 13th month every three years. So why is he adding a 13th month because the moon only has 354 days per year those are the laws of the moon that we get in enoch chapter 70s while the calendar itself is 364 days so each year the moon falls behind 10 days so every three years they use the 13th month to catch it back up and there's more points on this as well but that's exactly the error from jubilee 6 where it says they'll make observations of the moon seeing that it's coming in 10 days too soon and then they add a 13th month to make up for it, which is literally the error in Jubilee 6 that has been prophesied to happen. And I have a clip from one of Nick Vanderlane's videos. One of his most recent videos in the playlist is comparing the lunar Sabbath calendar versus 364 day solar calendar and solar Sabbath, a really important video to look into. And here's a clip from that speaking about there's no 13th month in scripture. And there's even with the armies and the chiefs and the captains, how they had one for each month. And there's 12 months. There is no 13th captain because there was never a 13th month in scripture. And just to have a quick overview of the 364 day solar calendar, 
It's 12 months, not 13 months. The 13th month does not exist. There is no record of a 13th month anywhere in the scriptures. Contrary, we only have 12 months recorded in the scriptures. If you read 1 Chronicles chapter 27, 1 through 15, David's army had 12 chiefs and 12 captains uh, for the 12 months. There was one chief and one captain per month, and there was no 13th month. First month, second month, third month, fourth month, fifth month, sixth month, seventh month, eighth month, ninth month, tenth month, eleventh month, and twelfth month. He didn't have a thirteenth month. Doesn't, it's not mentioned. Once every four years he had a thirteenth month. Or doesn't mention at all there is no thirteenth month. That's David. Solomon, his son, appointed twelve officers for the twelve months. No thirteenth month. In First Kings chapter 4, verse 7 through 19. There were 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. One for each of the year, see? Made his month in a year and made provision. So this verse is telling you, Solomon had 12 officers over all Israel, which provided victuals for the king in his household. Each man, his month in a year made provision. So there was no 13th month mentioned. There was no nothing like this mentioned in 1 Kings. Solomon knew because he learned he knew the calendar from his father David. It is 12 months. That's it. Another part in the New Testament, if you want to call it that, Revelation chapter 22, verse 2. There was 12 men of fruit, one for each month. No 13th month. In the midst of the street of it, and on the either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare 12 men of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So there's 12 fruits, one for each month. That means there's 12 months, no 13th month. It's not that hard. So there are 12 months in the 364-day solar calendar. Each month is 30 days per month. Kodesh in the Hebrew means month, and Yorek and Yoreak mean moon. If this was translated like this, it would have been a lot simpler for all of us to understand. But Babylon, Babel means confusion, and because of the Babylonian lunar calendar, it's confusion regarding the calendar. If it was just a solar calendar using Book of Enoch, Jubilees, Dead Sea Scrolls, the Torah and the Prophets, because it could be found in there, it would be a lot easier to understand. Now, I'm also going to play the clip from my interview with Larry Johnson, where I asked him about Enoch 80 and Isaiah 24 and TPR 225 and you can hear his response, and then I'll speak a little bit further about it. I want to speak about the calendar a little bit as well. Mm -hmm. So I have been on Nick Vanderlane's calendar, and I heard everything that you said about changing the calendar, and I watched uh, Become Set Apart's video once already. I plan to watch it again. But there's two scriptures that are sticking out to me about using the moon one of them is in Enoch 80, where in line three, it says, in the days of sinners, the years shall be shortened. Mm -hmm. And then in line six, it says, and the moon shall change its laws and not be seen at her proper period. And then in Isaiah 24, it says how the moon will be confounded. So those two scriptures are sticking out to me. If the moon is being confounded or confused, and if the moon is going to change its laws in the days of sinners, a.k.a. the end times, those two have been sticking out to me just about the calendar itself. And that's kind of what's preventing me from fully switching to become set apart's calendar. Okay. Uh, and then there's also in Jubilees, it said those will make uh, observance of the moon changing and would notice that will come day, come in, 10 days too soon. So you recalibrate those 10 days based on the spring equinox. So you would have to wait after the, the moon, the, the, the first full moon, you have to take an account that these things need to be recalibrated. So you skip all the way over to the next new moon, which is the full moon. And that's where you start the calendar. The spring equinox puts us in order to let us know, okay, we get it. We need to get ready for the new year. Then the moon changes, and then we have to wait and count to, 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 to recalibrate it. We know that the chimes are going to change. It says in Jubilee 6 that they will change, and you will notice that, that it will be coming in 10 days too soon because the moon is changing its laws. So we have to recalibrate that every year to make sure we are landing on the scriptural feast days and holy days. 
Yeah, that makes sense. So I plan to, like I said, you said to watch the video several times. So I plan to go through it again. Th those were just things that were sticking out to me, but that actually does make sense. So I'm still just, I don't like to just harshly change things until I really hear out the whole matter spiritually and, and really understand it. So that's something I'm still working on, but that's interesting. So as you can tell from that video, I wasn't totally convinced. And while it did kind of make sense after reflecting on it, after the fact, his answer is still not accounting for the moon changing its laws. Jubilee six says it will come in 10 days too soon because of the moon's original laws given in Enoch 78 and in chapter seventies. It's not coming in 10 days too soon because it's changing its laws, like Larry said. Its original laws are having it come in 10 days too soon because it only has 354 days. And then after the fact in Enoch chapter 80, we see that it will then change its laws. So they are only counting for the fact that it comes in 10 days too soon, which are the moon's original laws, not because it's changing its laws. We hear about that after. So... Larry said, we're going to notice that it's changing its laws and coming in 10 days too soon, but it's not coming in 10 days too soon because it changed its laws. It's coming in 10 days too soon because the moon only has 354 days per year, making it 10 days too short. So they're not observing it coming in 10 days too soon because it's changing its laws. Those are the original laws that it comes in 10 days too short. And then after an Enoch 80 is where we hear that after that, it's going to change its laws. Now, the moon each month usually has 29 or 30 days, and there is no way to tell how many days the moon will have each month without observing it. It could be 29 or it could be 30 days. Now, another big indicator is Judith 8.6, where she fasted all the days except for the Sabbaths and new moons, which is really new months, and the day before Sabbath and the day before new months. So how could she know when the day before a new moon was if she had to wait to observe the moon for either the full moon or the first sliver depending on what they say a new moon is so if it was day 29 for, first i'll read the scripture for you in judith 8 6 and she fasted all the days of her widowhood save the eaves of the sabbaths and the sabbaths and the eaves of the new moons really new months and the new months and the feasts and solemn days of the house of yasharel so we see that she fasted all the days of her widowhood besides the sabbath and the day before the sabbath and the new month and the day before the new month. So what I'm saying is if she was not fasting the day before a new month, how could she possibly have been? If it was a new moon where she had to observe the moon to, to confirm that it's a new moon coming in, whether it's a sliver of light or a full moon, how could she know a day in advance that it was about to be the new moon if she hadn't observed the moon yet? So if it was day 29 and she assumed that the next day was going to be a new moon, so she feasted and didn't fast, then what would she do if the next day she realized it was day 30 and still not a new moon? Because the moon has usually 29 or 30 days. So if on day 29 she said, all right, tomorrow is going to be the new moon and she didn't fast, but then the next day came and it still wasn't a new moon yet, she that scripture wouldn't make any sense. So she wouldn't be able to feast the day before a new moon because she would have to wait until that night to observe the moon. The reason is because this scripture should say new month, not new moon. And because on the Enoch solar calendar, each month follows 30 days, 30 days, 31 days. So she would know exactly when each month is starting and ending. She would have had to wait to observe the moon, which the moon has 29 or 30 days. So she would never know until that night which day it is, making it impossible to feast and not fast the day before a new moon because she hadn't observed the moon yet until that night to know which day of the month it is. Boom. So again, if I'm not explaining that clearly, if it was day 29, and so again, she, she didn't fast the day of the new moon and the day before a new moon, right? So if it was day 29 and she said, okay, I'm not going to fast today because tomorrow is the new moon, but what if that month had 30 days, then the next day is still part of the same month. It wasn't a new moon yet, so she would have done it a day early because the only way to know as far as people keeping new moons, observing the, the moon, you have to observe it at night. So it would be impossible for her, her to not fast during the day and then observe the moon at night and know which day it was. So that shows why it should say new month, not new moon. All right. So now to get to Sirach 43, also known as Ecclesiasticus 43. 
starting at line six. He made the moon also to serve in her season for a declaration of times and a sign of the world. From the moon is the sign of feast, a light that decreases in her perfection. The month is called after her name, increasing wonderfully in her changing, being an instrument of the armies above, shining in the expanse of heaven. Now, people see this scripture and say, okay, what feast is it talking about? But the Hebrew word where it says, from the moon is the sign of feast, that Hebrew word is moed or moedim. It's Strong's 4150 for moed. And it has a bunch of different definitions, appointed time, place, meeting, meeting place, times. So that scripture really should say from the moon is the sign of appointed times and not all appointed times are feast days because it could say a place or a meeting. So I referenced earlier, what is the moon for? It's for signs which we're going to get to like a blood moon and for appointed times what does it say in line six he made the moon also to serve in her season for a declaration of times and a sign of the world so when it goes to a blood moon it's a sign of the world for us to know we're in the end times the blood moon we're going to get to that so that's it Sirach 43 6 is what the moon's purpose is right there he made the moon also to serve in her season for a declaration of times and a sign of the world so when you see the sign of the world a blood moon you can declare that that you can declare the times that we're in the end times right another purpose for the moon is it's a timepiece for us all to reference for example If I say to someone, I'm going to leave for my journey on the full moon, no matter where you are in the world, you can look up at at the moon and see the sign, oh, it's a full moon, Rye is about to take his journey. It's a timepiece for us all to use. It's not a timepiece for us to get the Sabbaths and the months by. It's for example, like I said, if I say at the full moon, I'm going to leave for my journey, then no matter where you are in the world, you can look up and see the sign of the moon. I can declare the times and say, I'm leaving for my journey on the full moon. You look up and see the sign. It's a sign of the world. And then you'll know exactly when I'm leaving for my journey. And also when it goes to a blood moon, it's a sign of the world showing us the end times. It's a sign. Sirach 43.6 literally tells us what the moon is for. He made the moon also to serve in her season for a declaration of times and a sign of the world. And then in line seven is the mistranslation. From the moon is the sign of feast, but that Hebrew word moed or moedim is appointed times. So it really should say from the moon is the sign of appointed times, a light that decreases in her, per- her perfection. So the appointed time could be me saying I'm taking my journey or the appointed time of it being a blood moon. And then in line eight, the month is called after her name, increasing wonderfully in her changing, being an instrument of the armies above, shining in the expanse of heaven. So it says the month is called after her name. It doesn't say the month is called after her sign or her phases. It says after her name. Why? Because just like how the months progress, you, you have the first week of the month, the second week of the month, the third week, the fourth week of the month, the month follows a similar pattern as the moon does why because the moon goes through its phases throughout the month the month didn't start because of the moon but just regardless the month the moon has different phases just like a month has different phases so it says the month is called after her name it doesn't say it's called after the moon's phases it says after her name why because the month the moon has different phases that it goes through and just like a month has different phases that it goes through so people take that out of context saying see the moon is called after it says the the month is called after her name it doesn't say after her phases or her sign after her name because they they both have a similar format of how the month progresses and how a moon has different phases. All right, now let's get to the scriptures speaking about the blood moons and, and how the moon is for a sign, right? Luke twenty one twenty five, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth the distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Joel two thirty one. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of Yahuwah come so that's the prophecy like i said as it was in the days of noah so shall it be for the coming of the son of man before the flood the sun darkened and 
in Isaiah 24, it says the moon is going to be confounded or confused and the sun ashamed. Why? Because the sun shall be turned into darkness. It's ashamed. It won't be there. It, like Think about when you're ashamed, like you turn your face away, you hide when you're ashamed because the sun shall be turned into darkness. It won't be there. That's why it said in Isaiah 24, the sun is going to be ashamed. And in Joel 2.31, the sun shall be turned into darkness. It won't be there. It'll be ashamed. And the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of Yahuwah come. And then Acts 2.20, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and terrible day of Yahuwah come. And then Revelation 6.12, and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal and lo, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood. All right. And now the most easy scripture to see this Genesis 1 and 14 and Elohim said let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for appointed feasts and for days and years what is the moon it's a sign what is a blood moon a sign what did Luke 21 25 say there will be signs Luke 21 25 and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity the sea and the waves roaring and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and then Genesis 1 and 14 and Elohim said let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for appointed feasts and for days and years what is the moon for it's a sign Sirach 43 he made the moon also to serve in her season for a declaration of times and a sign of the world. So the moon is for signs, a blood moon, and it can also be every night it gives a sign depending on what phase it is. So I could say the sign that I'm going to leave for my journey is on the full moon. And you look up and see the sign from the moon that it's a full moon and you know I'm going to leave for my journey. The moon goes to a blood moon. You look up and see the sign that we're in the end times. The moon is for signs. Sirach 43 and 6. He made the moon also to serve in her season for a declaration of times and a sign of the world a sign of the world genesis 1 and 14 he made them for signs so the moon is a sign as far as a blood moon and it's also a timepiece for us all to use you can see every every time you see the moon it's giving a sign depending on what phase it is and that's how you can know i could declare the times it's a sign for the world for us all to look up and see, all right, Rise about to leave for his journey or look up and see, oh, it's a blood moon. We're in the end times. It's a sign. That's what the moon is for, a sign. Hallelujah. And another important piece of information that I find wrong with the lunar Sabbaths, lunar calendars is what if it's cloudy and or raining for several days? And just, like, again, the moon usually has 29 or 30 days. So what if on day 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, it was cloudy and rainy and you can't see the, the moon? So how could you know it, each month the moon has 29 or 30 days? So you don't know if it's going to have 29 days or 30 days without using the internet because now, of course, people look up on the internet and see, all right, this is when the new moon is. This is when a full moon is using the internet. But we have to remember that they didn't have the internet back in these days. So they could, if it was based on the moon, which it's not, but if it was, that means they would have had to literally observe the moon to see, okay, it's a new moon. So how... If it was cloudy or rainy from day 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, they would not know if that month had 29 moon days or 30 moon days, and they wouldn't know when the new moon, whether it's a full moon or a sliver of light, whatever you think it is, they wouldn't have any way to know if they couldn't see because there's no way to know if the month, if the moon had 29 or 30 days in a month without observing the moon. So if it was cloudy or rainy, they would have no way to know. Just like with Judith, she would have no way to know when to stop fasting the day before a new moon because she would have to observe it that night. So she wouldn't be able to stop fasting during the day and then observe it at night. It would be impossible to do that the day before because if she observed it that night and it was a new moon, then she had already missed her chance the day before. So that's another big indicator of why we're not meant to be observing the moon for Sabbaths or for months. 
Now, for me, before I even switched to Nick's calendar, I had to fully get this understanding of what the moon was truly used for because, and I even said when I first switched to this calendar, I said, I'm not just getting on this calendar, Nick's Enoch Solar calendar, because Larry Johnson is on it. I said, I'm not doing it for that reason. And clearly that point is proven because Larry has switched to become set apart's calendar and I'm not switching to that calendar as as I see it right now I'm not I have no plans to switch to that calendar so I'm not just doing whatever Larry is doing I'm not just doing whatever people are telling me I'm doing what I find to be the most true calendar which is Nick's Enoch solar calendar so with that being said before I even switched to this calendar about a year ago I had to get the understanding of what the moon was truly used for because I saw Sirach 43 and I was wondering okay uh, what is this feast that's talking about? And then I had to learn, oh, it's a mistranslation of appointed time, not necessarily feast day. All feast days are appointed times, but not all appointed times are feast days. So I had to get this understanding of what the moon was really used for because I was wondering and I wasn't going to switch to this calendar until I fully understood all of it, including what the moon was for. Now, me personally, I don't think Larry actually knew about the mistranslations and what the moon was really used for, that it's a sign, like we just covered. I don't know if Larry knew that when he switched to Nick's calendar. So then when he saw Become Set Apart's video making the claims that you have to use the moon for months of for Sabbath, which we're going to get to and expose in a moment, I think Larry then fell for it because he wasn't firm in his foundation about what the moon was actually used for about that it's a sign and that there's mistranslations in there saying new moon when it's really new month but me the reason why i didn't fall for become set apart's video is because i was already grounded in the truth of what the moon was actually used for and i'm not certain that larry knew that so that's why he was easily led off of nick's calendar and originally I wasn't going to switch to Nick's calendar until I actually learned all these aspects of it and had an answer for what the moon was really for, like Sirach 43. And then when I realized it was being mistranslated as new moon instead of new month and that the moon is for signs, like it says in line six, I then understood where the moon falls into on the correct Enoch solar calendar. And I speculate that Larry didn't actually have this understanding about what the moon was really for when he was on Nick's calendar. So he was more easily led off of Nick's calendar to become set apart's calendar. And then obviously when I asked Larry about it, about the moon changing its laws on the episode 2225, I obviously wasn't going to keep pressing him about it. Um, and making it turn into a full calendar debate because that's not what the episode was for. You know, I asked him and I got his answer. And at the time it did kind of make sense. But like I explained earlier, they were, he was actually incorrect in saying that they're going to notice the moon changing its laws coming in 10 days too soon, but it's coming in 10 days too soon because of the moon's original laws. And they don't have an answer for the moon changing its laws in Enoch 80. So maybe most high willing, I could try to reach out to Larry with this episode, trying to get him back on Nick's calendar. But ultimately, everyone is going to seek the truth and find whatever they are led to seek and find whatever the most high allows. So if I had to speculate and guess, that's why I think Larry was taken off Nick's calendar because of the original misunderstanding about the moon. I don't know if he ever had the true understanding when he was on Nick's calendar. And obviously it was amazing when me and Larry were both on Nick's calendar together, keeping the feast days at the same time. But like I said, I'm not just going to switch calendars to whatever Larry's doing. I We were both on it because we both thought it was true. I still think Nick's calendar is true while Larry has been led off of it to become set apart. And obviously the most high's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are higher than ours. So I don't know exactly why Larry was led to change to become set apart calendar if that one's not correct then this one the solar calendar is correct but for example if larry never switched to become set apart i probably never would have even asked him about the calendar in our episode together in our interview and thus i probably never would have even been doing this episode breaking down the calendar further so we don't know the most high's plans his thoughts and his ways are way higher than ours so we can't even understand or comprehend why things are happening but there's obviously always some reason even if we don't consciously understand what that reason is of why larry was taken off nick's calendar to become set apart but like i said i probably wouldn't even be doing this episode if larry wasn't taken off and went to become set apart's calendar 
So now that you've heard some of the initial red flags with Become Set Apart's full moon lunar calendar, like the 13th month and just other points that I covered, now I'm going to go in depth into more details, pulling things that he has said in his calendar video, debunking it even further than we've already done. What I've already provided are just my initial thoughts, and now I'm going to go through in detail pulling things that he says in his video and giving my explanation on it, debunking a lot of it. So to recap, the 13th month is one of the biggest red flags and also the fact that brothers keeping lunar calendars can't even get on one accord about whether it's a full moon or a sliver of light because it's neither. New moon should really say new month and that to me is very telling that brothers who are trying to be on a lunar calendar can't even get it straight whether it's a full moon or a sliver because it's neither. New moon should really say new month. And before we get into his video, another thing Become Set Apart does is he expressly says that the name is not Yah or Yahuwah. He says it's Ahaya, which what is Ahaya? Ahaya is the title of I am from Exodus. He specifically says Yah is not the name, but even the title, Ahaya is a title. It's not a name. It's the title of I am is what Ahaya is. And Ahaya even has Yah in the name, just like Yahusha, the son, has Yah in his name. Because the father's name is Yah, his son's name is Yahusha, coming in the name of Yah. In John 5 43, Yahusha says he has come in his father's name. Because the father's name is Yahuwah, the son's name is Yahusha, coming in the name of Yah. Hallelujah. We spoke about this in TPR 215, Every Knee Should Bow. And so Ahaya is just a title, it's not a name. And to me, become set apart literally says Yah is not the name and speaks out against it, but how can he say that when Ahaya literally has Yah in the name, just like Yahusha has Yah in the name? And then you look at the prophets like Jeremiah and Isaiah, the Hebrew name for Isaiah is Yeshayahu, which has Yah in the name, and the Hebrew name for Jeremiah is Yermayahu, also has Yah in the name. So Ahaya is a title, it's not a name. Just like there's other titles for the Most High, like El Elyon is the Most High God. So you don't see us coming out, you don't see me coming out and saying, oh, the name of the Father is El Elyon. That's not his name, that's a title, the Most High God. Just like Ahaya is a title saying, I am. And the name is Yah, and it really makes no sense for him to be saying Ahaya is the name because Ahaya is not a name, it's a title. And Ahaya literally has Yah in the name. So how can he say Yah is not the name when Ahaya has Yah in it? Just like Yahusha has Yah in it. The Hebrew words for Isaiah and Jeremiah have Yah in it. Hallelujah. And then another big problem that I have that I just recently noticed with Become Set Apart is in one of his most recent video live streams, I clicked on it. It was talking about a second exodus. And at the very start of the video, he starts praying on camera. And in Matthew 6, the Messiah says, do not pray in front of other people like the hypocrites do. So Become Set Apart should know better. And this is something that I've spoken about on this podcast series in TPR 202, Prepare Part 2. And in a lot of episodes, I spoke about how that's probably my biggest red flag of people in the truth, that the Messiah literally says, do not pray in front of other people. It's such a simple concept, and people should know better, especially someone who's trying to speak about the calendar and these deeper parts of Scripture. How can you miss Matthew 6? And and ignore that and pray in front of other people at the start of a live stream when that's one of the most simple parts of scripture. Matthew 6, starting at line 5, And when you pray, you shall not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Amen, I say unto you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, enter into your closet, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father which is in secret, and your Father which sees in secret shall reward you openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knows what things ye have need of before ye ask him. After this manner, therefore, pray ye. And then it goes into the Our Father prayer in Matthew 6. So, to me, people overcomplicate the scriptures unnecessarily, and they go into these off-the-wall doctrines. And furthermore, Matthew 6, literally the most, the two most simple points of scriptures, I think, are the Gospels 
and the Ten Commandments, right? Those are literally like the Gospels. Anyone who's sincerely in the truth should have obviously read the Gospels and be applying these very simple teachings. There's not a deeper meaning of Matthew 6, what I just read, where he says, do not pray in front of other people. It's literally a a commandment, an instruction of the Messiah saying, do not pray in front of other people. So then when Become Set Apart starts a live stream and says, let's say a prayer together and praying in front of other people, it's really hard for me to look past that because it's such a simple commandment and instruction that he's literally just ignoring. So again, people are missing the most simple points of Matthew 6, the Gospels, the most simple points of Scripture, and then trying to go into these deeper concepts of the calendar, for example, when they're literally ignoring the most simple concept in Matthew 6, do not pray in front of other people. And if he really wanted to pray to the Most High for a good live stream before he started recording, he should have prayed in secret in his prayer closet like the Messiah told us to do and pray to the Father and ask for a good live stream and then start the stream instead of starting the stream and then getting on camera praying in front of other people saying, let's pray. So literally anyone who's supposed to be in the truth should know about Matthew 6 and should know better about praying in front of other people like the hypocrites and that's why someone like become set apart should obviously know better we all should know better literally all of us and that's why it's really hard for me to take people serious who are trying to go into these deeper concepts like the calendar but they're skipping the most simple points of scripture people are overcomplicating scriptures unnecessarily And on top of that, they're literally missing the most simple points of Scripture. So that's a huge red flag to me and also another confirmation that the Most High gave to me. And obviously, Become Set Apart is sincere. He's a sincere brother in the truth trying to bring out truth. But we have to hold each other to an appropriate standard. And when the Most High literally says, do not pray in front of other people, we should not be praying in front of other people and people who are teaching and putting out videos and information should know better period and before i get into some of these points from become set apart's video in addition to everything i've covered so far i also commented on his video asking about how he accounts for enoch 80 and isaiah 24 and he replied with jeremiah 10 and 2 which is an out of context scripture which says uh He said, Jeremiah 10 and 2, for those that don't understand how to read the heavens. So Jeremiah 10 and 2 says, Thus says Yahuwah, learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. So that is a completely out of context scripture. So this is what was the exchange. I commented on his video and said, What do you think about Enoch 80, where it says, In the days of sinners, end times, and the moon shall change its laws and not be seen at its proper period. And also Isaiah 24, where it says, The moon shall be confounded. If the moon is confounded, Founded or confused and changing its laws and not being seen at its proper period, how can we be using the moon? He replied and said, Jeremiah 10 and 2 for those that don't understand how to read the heavens. And I said, so if you do know how to read the heavens, how do you account for the moon changing its laws? I've watched the video twice now, sincerely trying to learn, but those verses stick out to me. This video only addresses the moon's original laws, but doesn't talk about how to account for it changing its laws. And he never answered me again. So again, Jeremiah 10 and 2 is such an insincere, out-of-context scripture, and really what he's doing is bearing a false witness against me, saying that I don't understand how to read the heavens, but actually I understand how to read the heavens more than any lunar Sabbath keepers because they're not accounting for the moon changing its laws in Enoch 80. None of them have an answer, and he doesn't have an answer. He's just saying, oh, you're being dismayed at the heavens. You don't know how to read the heavens. No, I'm I'm sincerely asking, how do you account for it changing its laws? And nobody has an answer for this that I've seen. So again, he supposedly found the set-apart calendar of the Most High, and you know what I'm saying? But then when someone sincerely asks a question about Scripture, he can't even give a solution. He just gives an out-of-context, condescending an out-of-context scripture in a condescending matter, not actually answering what I asked. So again, another big red flag. If you, if someone sincerely asks a question about the calendar of the Most High that he claims he's restored the calendar and like has, has figured it out, how are you going to not answer and give an out-of-context scripture as an answer? Really weak, honestly, because I, I don't think that was a genuine response. And like I said, he can't answer for Enoch 80. All he can do is pull Jeremiah 10 and 2, an out-of-context scripture. 
he can't actually answer the matter which I asked him about Enoch 80 or Isaiah 24. So it was no answer. And again, this is supposed to literally be as he claims the correct calendar of the Most High. But when someone sincerely asks a question, he responds with a condescending out of context scripture that provides no help on how to read the heavens. And he's actually claiming a false witness by insinuating that I'm one of those that don't understand how to read the heavens, when in all reality, I know how to read them more because I can understand how the moon is going to change its laws. Meanwhile, while he can't even address that the scriptures say that. So again, we will know people by their fruits and obviously become set apart is sincere, but at the same time, how are you going to claim that you solved the calendar and then not even give a helpful answer when people ask questions? And 2 Timothy 2, which we covered in my last episode, says we should be apt to teach, not condescending and using out-of-context scriptures when people ask questions. So that's very telling as well. And like I've said, I haven't seen any lunar Sabbath keepers be able to accurately address and account for the moon changing its laws and become set apart is no different. Now, at the start of Become Set Apart's video, something I do agree with what he says is Proverbs 25 and 2. It is the glory of Elohim to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. So he points out how the Most High has purposely concealed this matter uh, purposely and for des- uh, by design. Like... People have not been meant to find the correct calendar until these last days. Like people that came before us weren't meant to find it. And it's a reason why we've all been on different calendars trying to find this out because the Most High has concealed this matter purposely and for some reason. Again, we don't necessarily know why because the Most High's ways are not our ways. But I agree that the Most High has concealed this matter purposely for some reason. And then also 2 Timothy 2, which we covered in the last episode, line 15, study to show yourself approved unto Elohim, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now we're going to go through some specific points and become set apart's video. Now, around the 11 minute mark of his video, he says the year starts after the sun reaches the spring equinox. But then later in the video, he will be talking about adding a 13th month after the spring equinox so this to me is a contradiction right there they won't be starting the next year until the first full moon after the spring equinox so to get into become set apart's video he starts out at some point saying that the sunlight represents the messiah's light and this is a dangerous concept because this is exactly what the false babylonians and pagans do is worship sun gods right so to to start comparing the messiah to the sunlight and to the sun itself is is a dangerous thing to be flirting with like yeah scripture says we are of the day and we're walking in the light the messiah's light but to literally like compare the messiah to the sun and the sunlight is is a little dangerous and you're flirting with some dark side concepts then around the 17 minute mark of his video he says solar calendar people completely remove sirach 43 6 and 7 but we already covered that earlier how it's a mistranslation and how Sirach 43.6 tells us that it's a sign of the world. So we're not removing that, and we covered that earlier. Then at the 18-minute mark, very importantly, he says that we are the moon, and the moon represents the Messiah's saints, right? And he goes into like kind of a wacky doctrine about Adam and Eve. And again, in Genesis 1 and 14, It says that the moon has been appointed to rule the night, right? But what do all the scriptures say? That we are children of the day. We are of the light. So he's saying that the sun in the sky represents the Messiah and the sunlight represents the Messiah's light and that we are the moon, right? And then you go to Genesis 1 and 16 and Elohim made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. So become set apart is saying that we represent the moon But what did the Most High say that the moon is for? The moon, the lesser light, to rule the night. But what are those scriptures that we heard earlier? We are the children of the day, the children of the light, walking in the day. So to me, this makes, and this is literally what like a lot of the whole calendar is based on him saying that the sun in the sky represents the Messiah or the sunlight represents the Messiah's light and that we are the moon, right? But This doesn't make any sense because the moon, think about the moon. The moon has periods through each month where the moon is darkness, where the moon is half light, half dark. How many, how many days per month is the moon full of light? One, maybe two days per month. 
and every other day of the month the moon has darkness on it where it's a half half lit a sliver a crescent three-fourths lit the moon always has darkness other than when it's a full moon which is like one or two days per month so that means all the other days of the month if we are the moon we are darkness but the scriptures say the complete opposite that we are light we are the children of the day so to compare us to the moon the most high literally says in genesis 1 and 16 elohim made two great lights the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night so the moon is to rule the night so become set apart says that we represent the moon so we rule the night we're not children of night. We're not children of darkness. We covered that earlier. The false religions, the synagogue of Satan, they are darkness. So why would we want to be ruling the night when the scriptures earlier said that we are the light walking in the daytime? First Thessalonians 5 and 5, like we covered earlier, ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So become set apart says that we represent the moon. The moon has been appointed to rule the night. So how can we be the moon if 1 Thessalonians 5 and 5 says, Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. And Become Set Apart literally puts this scripture in his slideshow, in his presentation. So to he starts out the video saying that we represent the moon, but the moon literally rules the night. And we are not of night. We are of the daytime. We are of the light, not of night, nor of darkness. So yeah, I agree that the Messiah represents light, but just the way that he continually kind of compares the sunlight to the sun of the Most High and to say that we are the moon just is, it doesn't make sense to me really. And he says the moon is always referred to as a her, so that means it must represent the bride, which is us, and Messiah is the bridegroom. But also in Proverbs 6.6, 6, the ant is referred to as a her or a she. And like I mentioned earlier, doves in the scripture are only referred to as a her or a she, never a he. So does that mean that the ant and the dove also represent us or the bride? No. Just because something is referred to as a her or a she in scripture doesn't mean it's referring to us. So he says the moon is always referred to as a her. So that means it's us, the bride, and the Messiah is the bridegroom. But uh, in Proverbs 6, 6, the ant is referred to as a her or a she. So does that mean that's representing us? No. And the doves in scriptures are represented as a he or a her or a she. So does that mean that's us? No. So he's saying the moon is always referred to as a her. So that means it must represent the bride, meaning us. But just because there's a lot of things that are her or she in scripture, but that doesn't mean it represents us. Wisdom is is referred to as a her or a she, but that doesn't, not everything that's a her or a she in scripture means it's us as the bride. So the Most High gives masculine and feminine traits to a lot of things in scripture, and not each one of them represents us. And then he puts up Psalms 19, 1 through 6, the heavens enumerate the glory of El, and the expanse shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night shows knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them has he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heavens, and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. So this is literally talking about the sun and the heavens and has nothing to do with the Messiah. But he is saying the sun represents the Messiah. And so he makes this verse about the Messiah when it's not. It's literally talking about the glory of the firmament and the heavens. It's not talking about the Messiah here. All right. And then another big red flag at 21 minutes and 40 seconds into the video, he quotes Revelation 19, 7 and 9. And I'll read that for you. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and his woman has made herself ready. That's line seven. And when he puts it on the screen, it says for the marriage of the lamb. And then he adds in parentheses, which will be on a feast day. And then he says, I believe it's Sukkot, tabernacles. Now, what does the scripture say? No man knows the hour, not even the Messiah. So he's saying become set apart is literally adding to scripture here because he puts Revelation 19, 7 through 9 on the screen and he puts line 7 for the marriage of the lamb and then he puts in parentheses adding to scripture which will be on a feast day he says. So he's literally adding to scripture and then he says he believes it's on Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot. 
But the scriptures say that no man knows the hour, not even the Messiah. We're going to get to those scriptures. So again, for someone to say, I believe the Messiah is going to come back on this day is pretty much an abomination because literally the Messiah says that he do, he himself doesn't even know. Mark thirteen thirty two. but of that day and that hour knows no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Right? So the scripture literally says, but of that day and that hour knows no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. So for become set apart to say that one, the Messiah is coming back on a feast day. He says, which will be on a feast day. And he says he believes it's on tabernacles. Literally, no man knows the hour, and the Messiah himself doesn't know the the hour. So for become set apart to say he believes he's coming back on tabernacles, yeah, it's possible he's coming back on tabernacles, but to say, oh, he's definitely, to say which will be on a feast day, he's definitely coming back on a feast day, and to say it's he believes it's tabernacles, that's literally implying that so the Most High decided not to tell the angels. He decided not to tell Yahusha himself, the son, when Yahusha's return is going to be. But apparently he decided to tell Become Set Apart that it's going to be on a feast day, that it's going to be on Sukkot. Literally, no man knows the hour. So we are not supposed to try and say, oh, it's going to be on this day. Oh, it's going to be on this day. Yes, it could be on a feast day. Yes, it could be on tabernacles. But for become set apart to literally say which will be on a feast day, confidently say he's coming back on a feast day. No man knows the hour, not even the angels, not even the Messiah himself. Only the Father knows. So become set apart is pretty much implying that he knows more than the angels. He knows more than the Messiah himself by claiming he knows when he's coming back, when no man knows the hour. So again, these are basic points of scripture that like to me, there's no excuse to be saying, oh, he's coming back on this day. He's coming back on a feast day. We don't know. We're not supposed to know. And also, Messiah is coming like a thief in the night. First Thessalonians 5 and 2, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of Yahuwah so comes as a thief in the night. So no man knows the hour. No man, no, the angels don't even know. The Messiah doesn't even know. And he's coming like a thief in the night. So to be saying, yes, it's coming on a feast day, or yes, he's coming on Sukkot, is wrong. And these are simple points that it's really hard to ignore how Scripture literally says, no man knows the hour, but then for become set apart to say, oh, he's coming on this day? No, we're not supposed to know. We're supposed to be ready. And yes, it's possible he's coming on a feast day. Yes, it's possible he's coming on tabernacles. But to outwardly say, yes, he's coming on a feast day or yes, he's coming on tabernacles to me is an abomination because literally the Most High said, no man knows the hour, not even the angels, not even the Messiah. So for someone to exalt themselves and say, oh, I know when he's coming, that's literally pretty much saying that you know more than the Messiah or you know more than the angels. We are not supposed to know. So that's a huge red flag. And also he's really adding to scripture because he put Revelation 19, 7 and 9 on the screen and it says for the marriage of the lamb. And then he puts in parentheses which will be on a feast day so for someone who didn't for someone who's brand new to the truth who doesn't know what the scriptures say they might just see that scripture on the screen and see which will be on a feast day and think that's part of the scriptures that's why we're not supposed to add to the scriptures because it's confusing we're supposed to read it for how it is and leave it at that we're not supposed to add to the scriptures or take away so when you add parentheses on the, when you're quoting revelation 19 7 and 9 and you add parentheses in there that's literally adding to the scriptures and he's adding something that literally the most high said and the messiah doesn't know the angels don't know and no man knows so that means become set apart as a man so he should not be saying that he knows when no man knows and the angels don't even know and the messiah doesn't even know so honestly that needs to be called out and then just some other scriptures that i believe he puts on the screen matthew 13 43 then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father who has ears to hear, let him hear. John 8 and 12, Then spoke Yahushua again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So again, when you're observing the moon phases for the Sabbath or for the months, you're literally walking in darkness because you have to walk outside in the dark and observe the moon. But Yahushua said, Then spoke Yahushua again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So literally, become set apart is putting these scriptures 
scriptures in his presentation, but is still talking about observing the moon and walking in darkness, walking in the night. And then Matthew five fourteen through 16, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a menorah. And it gives light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Then at 24 minutes and around 14 seconds, he says, The word play throughout scripture is all about the light because it is all about the light, spiritually and physically in this world. So literally, Become Set Apart is saying that in his video. The word play throughout scripture is all about the light because it is all about the light spiritually and physically in this world. So he says it right there. He's proving the point that it's a solar calendar. It's all about the light, walking in the light, walking in the day, spiritually and physically. Because, right, it's a spiritual reason about being in the light, being the children of the light. But physically, too, we're not supposed to be out at night. We're not supposed to be walking around at night. We're not supposed to be doing things at night. We're supposed to be home at night, resting, not working. We do all our work, all our stuff during the day in the light. So it's spiritually and physically and literally become set apart is saying this in his own video, literally proving the points that it's, he says the wordplay throughout scripture is all about the light because it is all about the light spiritually and physically in this world. He's right. It is all about the light. You are the light of the world. He says, again, the moon is a representation of us and the sun is a representation of the Messiah through and through scriptures. So again, if we are the moon, that means we are dark for a majority of the month. We are only full of light what, one or two days per month? All the other times, that means we have darkness within us. It makes no sense. And he's saying the sun is the Messiah's light, so that's why it's a solar calendar. The, if the sun represents the Messiah's light, like he says, that's why it's a solar calendar. And for him to say that we are the moon, it makes no sense because the moon rules the night. We are not of the night. The moon has darkness in it. We are supposed to literally be light all the time, every day of the year, not just for one full moon per month where the moon is full of light. The moon is always, almost always majority darkness with a little light in it. That sounds like duality from the dark side. We are light, so we are not the moon. He's saying that we represent the moon, and that makes no sense. We are not the moon. The moon is darkness ruling the night. We are ruling the day, walking in the day, living in the day, doing everything in the day. We are light, not darkness, and the moon represents darkness. That's why the moon cannot represent us and does not represent us. Then at the 30-minute mark, exactly, he points out how the Most High only called the light good and that darkness was never called good. So why would we be doing things in the dark, he says. Good question. We're not supposed to. So he literally says that the Most High only called the light good and that darkness was never called good. And he, quote, says, so why would we be doing things in the dark? Exactly, my brother. We are not supposed to be doing things in the dark. We are not supposed to be looking at the moon in the dark. We're not supposed to be out observing the moon in the dark, walking in the dark, nothing. He says, so why would we be doing things in the dark? We are not supposed to be doing things in the dark. It's a solar calendar. So literally like these little things that he's saying throughout the video are proving my points. He's literally proving it's a solar calendar by things that he's saying. So why would we be doing things in the dark? Exactly, bro. He's literally pr proving it by things that he says in the video. And then again, John 8, 12, Then spoke Yahushua again unto them, saying, I'm the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And 1 Thessalonians 5 and 5, Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. We are not of darkness. So how are we the moon how are we the moon ruling the night? Darkness. We're not. We're not the moon. We are not of darkness. We are of the day. Children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. We are the children of light. And then at 3641, he's talking about the synagogue of Satan. He says they are darkness and do things in the dark, spiritually, physically, which is the same thing as going out to look at the moon each night. He says, what you do physically should mirror how you are inwardly in the spirit. In light, we walk in spirit, spiritually and physically. Exactly. So he's saying the synagogue of Satan, they are darkness and do things in the dark. But when you go out every night to look at the moon in darkness, you're walking in darkness. It's the same thing the synagogue of Satan is doing, living in darkness. And he says, what you do physically should mirror how you are inwardly in the spirit. In light, we walk in spirit, spiritually and physically. Exactly. What you do physically should mirror how you are inwardly in the spirit. Spiritually, we're light. Following the Messiah, we are the children of light. And physically as well. That's why it's a solar calendar. 
And when you watch Nick Vanderlane's videos talking about the calendar, it feels spiritually like light. When you start living on the Enoch solar calendar, doing things in the daytime, you feel physically and spiritually the light. It's a solar calendar that he even becomes set apart as saying it. What you do physically should mirror how you are inwardly in the spirit. Exactly. Because spiritually we're the light and physically it's a solar calendar, walking in the daytime, walking in the light. The calendar is light. And then he points out John 11 and 9, Yahusha answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbles not because he sees the light of this world. Line 10, but if a man walk in the night, he stumbles because there is no light in him. So again, it's talking about spiritually and physically. And when you physically walk outside to observe the moon at night, you're walking in the night which he says will have you stumbling. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbles because there is no light in him. And Yahushua answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbles not because he sees the light of this world. So it's literally telling us walk in the day. It's a solar calendar, daytime, doing everything in the light in the day. And then at 3846, he says, we're supposed to only count in the presence of a clock, which is the sun, because the moon doesn't tell time. And at night, we're supposed to be sleeping. We're supposed to be resting. He literally says this in his video. So again, he's literally proving the points that it's a solar calendar. He says, we're supposed to only count in the presence of a clock, which is the sun, because the moon doesn't tell time. And at night, we're supposed to be sleeping. We're supposed to be resting. He literally says this in his video, and he's right. The moon doesn't tell time. It's a sign of the world, like we covered earlier. And he says, we're supposed to be sleeping. We're supposed to be resting, right? We're not supposed to be out there looking up at the moon. We're supposed to literally be sleeping and resting and not working. And then he goes on to say about people out on the towers being watchmen, and then he changes the subject to talking about telling time with candles. So he said it himself, and then he straight off talking about telling time with candles. But he said it first, straight up, we're supposed to only count in the presence of a clock, which is the sun, because the moon doesn't tell time. And at night, we're supposed to be sleeping. We're supposed to be resting. He said it right there. And then at 3930, he says, meaning we wasn't supposed to necessarily be living in the nighttime. Again, he's telling us we're not supposed to be living in the nighttime, walking in the night, going out to look at the moon at night. He says it, meaning we weren't supposed to necessarily be living in the nighttime. And then around the 45 minute mark, he goes into talking about how he debunked himself on a solar calendar. And then he points out Psalms 104, 19. He made the moon for a point of feast. The sun knows his going down, but again, it's Moed or Moedim, which means appointed times, not necessarily feasts. So Psalms 104.19, he made the moon for appointed times. The sun knows his going down. And then he says, Sirach 43, 6 and 7, he says, solar calendar, people run from that scripture, which we did not run from that scripture. We showed what it really means. Sirach 43 and 6 is what the moon is really for. And 7 is a mistranslation. We covered that earlier a sign of the world. He even says it twice. And again, a blood moon is a sign. He he becomes set apart, reiterates a sign of the world. He says it twice because a blood moon is a sign. Because all, And then he says, because all the moon does is give signs. The moon isn't here to count for us. That's what the sun's job is. The moon is literally a sign for the world. He's right. Like literally all of these things that he's saying, he's actually proving the solar calendar subconsciously without him knowing. He says, because all the moon does is give signs. Exactly. When you look up and it's a full moon, it's a sign. When you look up, it's a sliver of light. It's a sign. Every moon phase is a sign. And he says, the moon isn't here to count for us. That's what the sun's job is. The moon is literally a sign for the world. He's saying it. He's telling you. So when you watch his video, you'll notice he's literally proving the points for a solar calendar without him knowing it. And then he says how the moon is a sign for feast, but the moon is a sign for appointed times as we covered the mistranslation. It's a sign for appointed times, not necessarily feast. And again, a blood moon is an appointed time showing that it's the end times. And again, the month is called after her name. We covered that earlier because the way the month and the moon changes, the, the month goes through its time and the moon goes through its different phases. The month has different phases of, of the month. That's why it says the month is called after her name. And then he says, no one, no one on solar calendars can do anything with this precept. They literally ignore it. I disagree because we don't ignore that scripture, and I'm, I'm showing you what Sirach 43, 6, and 7 actually means. And like I said, before I switched to Nick's calendar, I did not ignore that verse because I knew I needed an answer for that verse before switching to Nick's solar calendar. And then I realized that it's a mistranslation, 
And that's what gives us the inaccurate interpretation about line seven and Sirach 43 and six is what it really is for. It's a sign like become set apart just said. So he's saying that we literally ignore it on a solar calendar. We don't ignore it. We're not ignoring it in this episode. And even when I first switched to the calendar, I was not, I was not ignoring that verse. And then also he uses a lot of Babylonian pagan names for the names of the month. Like in scripture, it tells us Abib is the first month. But then in addition to that, he's using a lot of false pagan Babylonian names for the months, which is just incorrect. And then he points out in Jubilees 12, 16, which says, and in the sixth week and the fifth year thereof, Abram set up throughout the night on the new moon, new month of the seventh month to observe the stars from the evening to the morning in order to see what would be the character of the year with regard to the rains. And he was alone as he sat and observed. So he uses this scripture to say that uh, Abraham, Abram, observing the stars at night was what was going to give him the character of the year but it says with regard to the rains it doesn't say the 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 character of the year with regard to the calendar or the months or the sabbaths it says with regard to the rains so i believe he's taking that scripture out of context because it says with regard to the rains of the character of the year not with regard to the calendar or the feast days or the sabbaths or the months and then jubilees 2 and 9 says and on the fourth day he created the sun and the moon and the stars and set them in the expanse of the heaven to give light upon all the earth and to rule over the day and the night and divide the light from the darkness and Elohim appointed the sun to be a great sign on the earth for days and for Shabbats and for months and for feasts and for years and for Shabbats of years and for jubilees and for all seasons of the years so he says nowhere does it imply that we should solely use the sun without the moon but nowhere in there does it also imply that we also need the moon he's saying that we need both of them but the verse says that the sun is for all those things. And Elohim appointed the sun to be a great sign on the earth for days and for Shabbats and for months and for feasts and for years and for Shabbats of years and for jubilees and for all seasons of the year. So he's saying that you still need the moon for that, but the scripture says use the sun. It's not implying that you need the moon for all that. It says use the sun. And so he says any solar calendars are very easily debunked, but I disagree with that, obviously. And then in Enoch 78 or 77, depending on the translation, it says her light is accomplished according to the sign of the year. It doesn't say this is the sign of the year. It says according to the sign of the year. And then at the one hour and 15 minute mark, he says again that the Messiah is going to return on Feast of Trumpets, which earlier he said at Sukkot Tabernacles, but now he says Feast of Trumpets, which they're around the same time but different. But he says again, the Messiah is going to return on Feast of Trumpets, but earlier he said during Tabernacles. And again, we don't know the day. And he says if Feast of Trumpets is on a new moon, that's how it could be a blood moon, Joel 2.31. But again, he's assuming that he knows when it will be. It could just be on any full moon or blood moon. It doesn't have to necessarily be on a feast day. He's assuming that but it never says anything about it being on a feast day. And then another important point is he keeps saying clear as day throughout the video, which is ironic. Like he'll be pointing something out and he says, see, clear as day, clear as day. Why clear as day? Because it's a solar calendar. So it's ironic that he uses that uh, figure of speech clear as day all throughout the video. Because again, it's like subconsciously and spiritually he knows and he's just saying all these points that are actually proving it's a solar calendar without him actually knowing it. And another important point before I continue on, we're almost at the end of his video and almost at the end of this episode. Another important point is, is brothers always imply and say like, oh, if you're not on the right calendar, you're going to miss the Messiah's returning. Or if you're not on the right calendar, you won't be saved. Like scripture never says anything like that. People are just assuming that like, yeah, I think we should all try and find as best we can the calendar. But like we said earlier, the Most High has been concealing this matter purposely. So for people to say, oh, you have to be on the right calendar, for people to say, oh, if you're not on the right calendar, you're going to miss it. Like they're adding to the scriptures, making that up. The scriptures doesn't say that. Yeah, we have to try and find the calendar as best we can. But that's a disingenuous argument is saying like, oh, you have to be on the right calendar because the scripture doesn't say that. And the Most High is... Uh, concealed this matter purposely like we covered earlier so that's just a side point all right and now we're going to get into jubilee 6 which we referenced earlier really important starting at line 32 and command you the children of yasharel that they observe the years according to this reckoning 364 days and these will constitute a complete year and they will not disturb its time from its days and from its feasts for everything will fall out in them according to their testimony 
and they will not leave out any day nor disturb any feast. But if they do neglect and do not observe them according to his commandment, then they will disturb all their seasons and the years will be dislodged from this order and they will disturb the seasons and the years will be dislodged and they will neglect their ordinances. And all the children of Yasharel will forget and will not find the path of the years and will forget the new moons, new months, and seasons and Shabbats and they will go wrong as to all the order of the years. For I know and from henceforth will I declare it unto you, and it is not of my own devising, for the sefer lies written before me, and on the heavenly tablets the division of days is ordained, lest they forget the feast of the covenant and walk according to the feast of the other nations after their error and after their ignorance. For there will be those who will assuredly make observations of the moon, how it disturbs the seasons and comes in from year to year ten days too soon. For this reason the years will come upon them, when they will disturb the order and make an abominable day the day of testimony and an unclean day a feast day, and they will confound all the days, the holy with the unclean and the unclean day with the holy. For they will go wrong as to the months and Shabbats and feasts and jubilees. For this reason I command and testify to you that you may testify to them. For after your death your children will disturb them so that they will not make the year 364 days only. And for this reason, they will go wrong as to the new moons and seasons and Shabbats and feasts, and they will eat all kinds of blood with all kinds of flesh. So again, in line 36, for there will be those who will assuredly make observations of the moon, how it disturbs the seasons and comes in from year to year, 10 days too soon. For this reason, the years will come upon them when they will disturb the order and make an abominable day, the day of testimony. So that's exactly what they're doing is they're observing that the moon is coming in 10 days too soon and saying, OK, now we have to wait till the next new moon to start the year. That's exact because they're saying it's 10 days too soon. That's exactly what this prophecy says. And it's in- amazing because it literally says at the end and they will eat all kinds of blood with all kinds of flesh. And then in Isaiah 24, like we covered earlier in line five, it says about breaking the everlasting covenant, Noah's covenant, not eating flesh with blood and then it's talking about the moon being confounded so in jubilee 6 it literally talks about them making observations of the moon and going wrong and as a result of all that in addition to all that they will also eat all kinds of blood with all kinds of flesh so you have the moon error and then you have the error of eating flesh and then in isaiah 24 you have the moon being confounded And then also then breaking the everlasting covenant, which is Noah's covenant, not eating flesh with the blood. So literally, Jubilee 6 relates the error of the moon and not eating flesh with the blood. And then Isaiah 24 speaks about the moon being confounded and breaking the everlasting covenant, which is Noah's covenant, not eating flesh with the blood. So again, look at Nick Vanderlane's playlist about restoring Noah's covenant because it's very important that we are not consuming flesh with the blood. And I personally believe that when people are eating flesh, unless they boil the flesh and pour out the water, the blood, they are still eating flesh with blood without them knowing it today. That's why both of these prophecies in Jubilee 6 and Isaiah 24 speak about the moon and the error of blood, both in those prophecies and scriptures. All right, now at the one hour and 22 minute mark of his video he speaks about how enoch 74 is translated differently in two different translations the sefer translates it differently from how it says in the rh charles translation right so in enoch 74 in the rh charles in line 12 through 14 it says The moon falls behind the sun and stars to the number of 30 days, and the sun and the stars bring in all the years exactly so that they do not advance or delay their position by a single day unto eternity, but complete the years with perfect justice in 364 days. That's Enoch 74, line 12 in the R.H. Charles version. Then you go to the Sefer, Enoch 74, line 13. The moon brings on all the years exactly that their stations may come neither too forwards nor too backwards a single day, but that the years may be changed with correct precision in 364 days. So he points out in his video how the R.H. Charles version says 
the sun and the stars bring in all the years exactly so that they do not advance or delay their position by a single day unto eternity, but complete the year with perfect justice in 364 days. And then he notes how in the Sefer it says the moon brings in the years. So he defers and says he just goes with the Sefer version and says this is true. But I can also, so what I'm saying is that there's a there's a translation for both. In the Sefer, it says the moon brings in the years. But in the R.H. Charles version, it says the sun and the stars bring in all the years. And it says how it's 364 days only. So what I'm saying is that become set apart is just choosing to use the Sefer translation because that says the moon brings in all the years exactly. But... Again, this in a sense is cherry picking scriptures because then in the Sefer, when you go to Psalms 81 and 3, in the Sefer it says, Blow the shofar on the dark new moon today on our solemn feast. So, become set apart is saying that a new moon is a full moon, and he's using the Sefer of Enoch 74 to say the moon brings in all the years exactly. But then also in the Sefer Psalms 81 and 3, it says, blow the shofar on the dark new moon today on our solemn feast. So in a sense, he's trusting the Sefer's translation of the moon in Enoch 74, but then in the Sefer's translation, in the same translation in the Sefer of Psalms 81 and 3, he doesn't trust that that because in Psalms 81 and 3 in the Sefer, it says the dark new moon, but become set apart says it's a full moon. But then in the Sefer again, in Enoch 74, he's going with that version saying the moon brings in all the years exactly. So he's picking and choosing which translations of the Sefer he wants to use. Whereas I'm pointing out how the R.H. Charles version says the sun and the stars bring in the, the years exactly, not the moon. So as far as the mistranslation of it's saying new moon when it should be new month. Psalms 81 and 3 should really say, blow the shofar on the new month today on our solemn feast. And then also same thing in Proverbs 720 in the Sefer, he has taken a bag of silver with him and will come home at the day of the dark new moon. So in the Sefer, they, they speak about the new moon as a dark moon, but it becomes set apart, says that it's a full moon. But then he's also using the Sefer translation of Enoch 74 to say the moon brings in the years exactly. So in a sense, he's kind of cherry picking what versions, what translations speaking about the moon from the Sefer he wants to use and ignoring the ones that in the Sefer that say it's a dark new moon. But again, it's neither. It's not a full moon or a dark new moon because it's new month, not new moon. And then the other scripture, in addition to Enoch 80, saying the moon is going to change its laws and not be seen at its proper period. And then Isaiah 24, saying the moon will be confounded. Another perfect scripture for us in Enoch 74, in lines 4 and 5, speaking about the moon, it says, And in certain months she alters her settings, and in certain months she pursues her own peculiar course. So in Enoch 80, it says, I'll read it for you. In Enoch 80, starting at line 3, In the days of sinners, the years shall be shortened. And then you skip to line 6. The moon, still speaking about the days of sinners, the end times. The moon shall change its laws and not be seen at its proper period. But in those days shall heaven be seen, and barrenness shall take place in the borders of the great chariots in the west. It shall shine more than the orders of light, while many chiefs among the stars of authority shall err, perverting their ways and works. And then also in Isaiah 24, what we read earlier, that the moon will be confounded. So we have three scriptures here showing that the moon is going to change its laws. Enoch 80 says the moon shall change its laws and not be seen at its proper period. Isaiah 24 says the moon is going to be confounded, which means confused. And then also in Enoch 74, speaking about the moon, and in certain months she alters her settings, and in certain months she pursues her own peculiar course. So that means when they give us the laws of the moon, it's saying that the, the moon is going to change its laws in Enoch 80. In Isaiah 24, the moon is going to be confounded. And then even in Enoch 74, it's saying that in certain months, the moon is going to pursue its own peculiar course and, and alter her settings. Just like in Enoch 80, it's going to change its laws and not be seen at its proper period. And nobody who is on lunar calendars, lunar Sabbaths, can account for these three scriptures saying that the moon is going to change its laws, it's going to be confounded, 
and it's going to change its course and do its own thing. It's going to change its laws, which is because we're not supposed to be using the moon for Sabbaths or for months. It's a sign, a blood moon and a sign of the world. It's a sign. And then Enoch 82, starting at line 5 in the Sefer. With respect to the progress of the sun in heaven, it enters and goes out of gate for 30 days with the leaders of the thousand classes of the stars, with four which are added and appertain to the four quarters of the year, which conduct them and accompany them at four periods, which are the days of the seasons, which we're going to hear about in Jubilee 6 as well. Respecting these, men greatly err and do not calculate them in the calculation of every age, for they greatly err respecting them, nor do men know accurately that they are in the calculation of the year. But indeed, these are marked down forever, one in the first gate, one in the third, one in the fourth, and one in the sixth, so that the year is completed in 364 days, period, 364 days. And that's talking about the four days of the seasons, which we're going to hear about in Jubilee 6 which makes it 364 days. And again, Become Set Apart says that the people that came before us were not meant to find the most high set apart days. I agree. Like we're saying, he's concealed this matter purposely because we're supposed to come into these points at the end times. And then at an hour and 28 minutes, he says, we add a month, adding a 13th month. He says the 13th month stays a part of the previous year. It's an added month. But again, how does that make any sense? We literally just read the scripture Enoch 82, 7, so that the year is completed in 364 days. So it makes no sense if you're adding a 13th month, then it's increasing the previous year beyond 364 days. There's multiple scriptures saying it's 364 days exactly, nothing more. And then he says, and then you just let it be the added month. So that would literally push it beyond 364 days makes no sense there is no 13th month and then also again like we covered enoch 82 line 7 it's 364 days all right and then around one hour and 36 minutes into his video he gets into the new month festivals in jubilee 6 so i'll read this for you and then we'll discuss a little bit further all right it's jubilee 6 starting at line 23 and again when it says new moon it's really new month and on the new month of the first month and on the new month of the fourth month and on the new month of the seventh month and on the new month of the tenth month are the days of remembrance and the days of the seasons and the four divisions of the year these are written and ordained as a testimony forever and noah ordained them for himself as feasts for the generations forever so that they have become thereby a memorial unto him and on on the new moon of the first month he was bidden to make for himself an ark and on that day the earth became dry and he opened the ark and saw the earth and on the new month of the fourth month the mouths of the depths of the abyss beneath were closed and on the new month of the seventh month all the mouths of the abyss of the earth were opened and the waters began to descend into them and on the new month of the tenth month the tops of the mountains were seen and noah was glad and on this account he ordained them for himself as feast for a memorial forever and thus are they ordained and they placed them on the heavenly tablets each had 13 weeks from one to another past their memorials from the first to the second and from the second to the third and from the third to the fourth and all the days of the commandment will be two and fifty weeks of days and these will make the entire year complete thus it is engraven and ordained on the heavenly tablets and there is no neglecting this commandment for a single year or from year to year. And command you, the children of Yasharel, that they observe the years according to this reckoning, 364 days, and these will constitute a complete year, and they will not disturb its time from its days and from its feasts, for everything will fall out in them according to their testimony, and they will not leave out any day nor disturb any feast. And then it goes on to read the rest of the scriptures, which we read before, speaking about them making observations of the moon, disturbing the feast days. But we could see that the new month of the first month, the fourth month, the seventh month, the tenth month, they are the days of the seasons, and they are feast days, memorials that Noah ordained. And on this account, he ordained them for himself as feasts for a memorial forever, and thus are they ordained. And on the new month of the first month, and on the new month of the fourth month, and on the new month of the seventh month, and on the new month of the tenth month are the days of remembrance and the days of the seasons and the four divisions of the year. These are written and ordained as a testimony forever. All right, and then around an hour and 40 minutes in, he wonders, are new moon Sabbaths? And he points out how there's no buying or selling on the uh, new month festivals. Again, Amos 
8 and 5, saying, When will the new month be gone that we may sell grain, and the Shabbat that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small, and the shekel great, and falsifying the balances by deceit? So he points out in Amos 8 and 5 that there's no buying or selling, and there's no working. So as far as the rules for a new month festival, it's not the Sabbath because... Um, the Sabbath is its own special day. It's similar to a Sabbath. There's no buying or selling. There's no working. But you can cook on a new month festival, whereas on a Sabbath, you cannot cook. So for a new month, no working, no buying or selling, but you can cook on a new month festival. And we're going to get into more scriptures about the Sabbath being more important than the new month festivals and more important than all the other feast days. We're going to get to that in Jubilees 226 in a moment. But around an hour and 42 minutes in, he wonders if every new month is a feast day. He concludes that it's not every new month. He says just the first, the fourth, the seventh, and the tenth month. And at an hour and 43, he says, those would be said in vain. What would be the point of talking about the first, the fourth, the seventh, and the tenth if all new moons are feast days? If they're all feast days, what's the point of pointing out the first, the fourth, the seventh, and the tenth, because those are the special new month festivals for the days of the seasons, which we just heard about in Jubilees. One more time. And on the new month of the first month, and on the new month of the fourth month, and on the new month of the seventh month, and on the new month of the tenth month, are the days of remembrance and the days of the seasons in the four divisions of the year. These are written and ordained as a testimony forever. And Noah ordained them for himself as feasts for the generations forever, so that they have become thereby a memorial unto him so those, the first, the fourth, the seventh, and the tenth new month festivals, they are memorials, they are feasts for generations forever as a memorial, and they are the days of remembrance and the days of the seasons. So Become Set Apart wonders, what's the point of pointing out the first, the fourth, the seventh, and the tenth, saying it's in vain to point them out? But no, every new month festival is a feast day, and the f- new month of the first month, the fourth month, the seventh month, the tenth month, those are special ones. Why? Because they're feasts for a memorial. They're days of remembrance and they're the days of the season. So it's not in vain to point out those ones specifically. Every new month festival is a feast day, but those are, it's not in vain to point out those specifically because they are the special days. They're days of remembrance, they're memorials, and they're the days of the season. So it's absolutely not in vain to point those out. And he's incorrect in saying that it's just the first, the fourth, the seventh, and the tenth. Those are the only new month festivals. No, every new month is a, is a new month festival, but the days are the new month of the first, the fourth, the seventh, and the tenth month are special days, the days of remembrance that Noah ordained and their memorials, and they're the days of the season. So it's not in vain to point those out specifically. And then he uses Numbers chapter 1, line 1 through 3, to say that they were, it wasn't a new month on that day, but they're not working and they're not doing anything that break the rules of a new month festival. Again, for a new month, you can't work, you can't buy or sell, but you can cook, you can do other things. It's not as strict as the rules for a Shabbat. So he uses Numbers 1 to say, oh, th- that wasn't a, a new month festival. They were doing other things, but they're not breaking any rules of a new month festival. They're not working. They're not buying or selling. So it was a new month festival, and he's incorrect in saying that. And another scripture to prove that every new month is a new month festival, Numbers 10.10. 10. Also in the day of your gladness and in your solemn days and in the beginnings of your months, you shall blow with the trumpets over your ascending smoke offerings and offer the sacrifices of your peace offerings that they may be to you for a memorial before your Elohim. I am Yahuwah Elohakim. So again, this says in the beginnings of your months. So every new month, the first day of any month is the new month festival. And the first day of the first month, the fourth month, the seventh month, the tenth month, those are the special days of remembrance that Noah ordained for memorials and for the days of the season. So Become Set Apart is incorrect in saying that the only new month festivals, new moons, as he says, are only the first, the fourth, the seventh, and the tenth. No, those are the special days. And every new month, is a new month festival, and the first, the fourth, the seventh, and the tenth are the special ones, the days of remembrance that Noah ordained as feasts forever in the days of the seasons. And we can see that there's different rules for the Shabbat compared to a new month festival. That's why you can cook on a new month festival, for example. And in Jubilees 2.26, he created heaven and earth and everything that he created in six days. And Elohim made the seventh day holy, again, the seventh day holy, 
for all his works. Therefore he commanded on its behalf that whosoever does any work therein shall die, and that he who defiles it shall surely die. And then line 27, Wherefore do you command the children of Yasharel to observe this day, that they may keep it holy, and not do thereon any work, and not to defile it, as it is holier than all other days? So Jubilees 2.27 tells us that the Sabbath is holier than all other days. So the Sabbath has different rules than the the new month festivals, and the Sabbath really has different rules from all the other feast days because, yes, the feast days are important. Yes, the new month festivals are important. Yes, the first, the fourth, the seventh, and the tenth month new month festivals are important. But we can see that the Sabbath is holier than all other days, all other feast days included. The Sabbath is holier. Jubilees 2.27. So that's why there's different rules for the Shabbat, the new month festivals, and just the other feast days as well. And then at an hour and 45 minutes in, he says sunrise to sunset is for the feast days. And we're just readdressing that the next biblical day hasn't started until the sun comes up the next day. So yes, there's no Sabbath night or no Sabbath evening, but the next day hasn't started until the sun comes up the next day. So by the evening and the night of the Shabbat, we're already at home resting and not working. And the next biblical day starts the following day at sunrise. And then we're at really the last few points here around two hours and 12 minutes into his video become set apart says that we have to wait for the fifth day of creation week to observe the moon but this also doesn't make sense to me because the sun and the moon were created on day four which means by the night of day four the most high had stopped working meaning the sun and the moon were already created because they were created during the day on day four so the moon would have been in the sky on the night of day four not the night of day five it was created during the day of day four and then the night comes after the day so night four four the moon was already there it was already created earlier on day four so i don't understand his argument or his logic in saying that you can't observe the moon till the fifth day of creation week when the sun and the moon were created on the fourth day of creation week and then the fourth night after the day of day four on that night the moon was already in the sky so he would be able to observe it then But again, these points are really irrelevant, but so yeah, it would already be there for night four because it was created during the day on day four. And really the last few points of his video at two hours and 21 minutes, he starts talking about Orion and the Pleiades and says at two hours and 22 minutes that Orion actually is our Messiah. He's the coming of our Messiah. Literally, Orion represents the second coming of our Messiah, he says. Now, again, this is becoming very dangerous and is literally flirting with many dark side demonic concepts, just like saying, oh, the sun in the sky represents the Messiah or the sunlight represents the Messiah. It's dangerous and you're flirting with dark side concepts because that's what the dark side people do is worship sun gods. And then to say that Orion, like a constellation or stars, represents the Messiah is literally flirting with dark side concepts and is very dangerous. Now, I'm not sure if there's any truth or not to that because I don't really look into the stars and all that stuff because I see that it's such a fine line. Yeah, the Most High created the stars and and the luminaries, but it's such a fine line because literally the dark side with astrology and observing the stars and all the constellations, they're doing all kinds of dark side and wicked wicked things. So it's like, why are we even going to flirt with these concepts unnecessarily to try and compare the Messiah to a, a constellation of stars? Like, it's literally flirting with dark side concepts. And what is the point? To me, there's no point in flirting with it. There's no point in flirting with those dark side concepts unnecessarily. And to me, it's unnecessarily. So it's dangerous in flirting with dark side concepts to literally say Orion actually is our Messiah or represents the coming of the Messiah, like he said. It's dangerous and not unnecessary to be flirting with that stuff, in my opinion. So it's like, what's the point of even flirting with these dark side concepts? What is the profit? What is the point in doing so? What's the profit of doing so? It's not worth it to flirt with these things, to be honest, in my opinion, to be flirting with these dark side concepts. And then finally, at two hours and 43 minutes in the last minute of the video, he says, if you want to get one of these tour calendars, you can go to my store on Etsy and buy one. It's up right now. If this presentation has been a blessing and you want to sow a blessing into this ministry, you can always donate, and he says what his cash app is. So again, what does Matthew 10 and 8 say? So again, what does Matthew 10 and 8 say? Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely give. So again, I'm, I'm really not trying to nitpick here, but it's really hard for me to look past these points that 
become set apart is saying that he just solved the calendar you know what i'm saying and then he says if you want to get one of these tour calendars you can go to my store on etsy and buy one it's up right now is that what the prophets would do if the prophets just restored the calendar and brought out the truth of the calendar something that has been literally hidden for years and generations we've all been trying to find this truth is that what the prophets would do is that what the messiah would do literally say oh if you want the calendar come and buy one like yeah he put out a whole free video but like again it's one thing if you want to sell t-shirts or you want to do this but to literally say oh come and buy the calendar like how are we supposed to believe this was the real true calendar if now you're saying okay come and buy it from me like yes there's a whole video on it but still like Again, these are just points like when you're really in the truth, you shouldn't be trying to make money off the Torah calendar, like period. Like how how can you say that? How can any prophet, it, would any of the prophets or would the Messiah himself be trying to make money off the Torah calendar? No, he wouldn't. And in Matthew 10 and 8, it says, freely you have received, freely give. And in Matthew 10 and 8, it says, freely you have received, freely give. And so he said, if you want to get one of these tour calendars you can buy one on etsy and then he said if this presentation has been a blessing and you want to sow a blessing into this ministry you can always donate through cash app like i get it but at the same time we're not supposed to be making money off the scriptures we're not supposed to be making money off the tour calendar we're not supposed to do a whole presentation and then say all right uh do you want to provide a blessing like freely we've received freely give so those are just a lot of the points that I find wrong with Become Set Apart's presentation, his calendar, him praying in front of people in that second Exodus video, him calling on the name of Ahia, saying that Ahia is a name when it's a title, saying Yah is not, not the name when Ahia literally has Yah in that title, and a lot of other things. And at the end of the video is very telling when he says if you want to buy the calendar like come on we shouldn't be trying to make money off the tour calendar especially if like if this has been a matter that's been concealed so much and you're saying you just solved the calendar and then saying all right come and buy it from me or saying if this presentation was a blessing like donate money like it's just that's not how we're supposed to be we're supposed to freely give as we have freely received and something else that's really telling as well if you go to nick vanderlane's channel on youtube and you go to the about page he writes a whole thing about who he is what his name is and his journey and the last line of it it says i do not accept or ask for monetary gifts freely i receive freely i give and like I said, when you go to Nick's website, EnochCalendar.com, he literally created an, an entire spreadsheet from 2019 to 2029 of the calendars all in one spreadsheet. And again, he literally is coming out and saying, Nick Vanderlane coming out and saying that he does not accept or ask for monetary gifts. Freely he receives, freely he gives, which is what scripture says in Matthew 10 and 8. So I think that part is very telling as well, showing that Nick Vanderlane is not asking for money and he doesn't accept money or gifts because we're not supposed to be making money off the scriptures. We're not supposed to be making money off the calendar. It's one thing if you want to create t-shirts and sell them, whatever, that's whatever. But we are not supposed to be making money off the scriptures, off the truth, off the calendar. Messiah said, freely you have received, freely give. And Nick Vanderlane, whose calendar we are on, the Enoch Solar calendar, he reiterates that same thing and explicitly says he does not ask or accept monetary gifts freely he receives freely he gives so i think that part is very telling as well i'm not trying to nitpick and pick on become set apart but it's just hard to watch an entire two hour long video and then at the end say oh if you want to buy the calendar buy it or if you want to if this presentation was a blessing send me money it's just hard to it's it's really hard to get around those points because i know the prophets and the messiah were not doing that freely they received freely they gave hallelujah all right and so now to finish up this episode again check out nick vanderlane's youtube playlist about the enoch calendar also check out his playlist about restoring noah's covenant and again you if you want to be on become set apart's calendar watch his video if if everything i said in this episode didn't convince you to be on nick's calendar and if you still want to be on become set of parts and you want to watch this video and discern it for yourself that's what everyone should be doing is discerning these points for themselves go to nick's channel if you want to go to become set of parts channel and find what you seem to be true and that's why i did this episode to show why i think become set of parts calendar is incorrect 
and why I believe Nick Vanderlyn's calendar is correct. We all have a different interpretation, so you have to search out these matters for yourself and learn it for yourself. You can't just listen to what someone is saying, do this or do that. You have to learn it and do it for yourself and ask the Most High and he will tell you. But I just wanted to point put a lot of these points in one episode and help help people understand these points and get people to look into it for themselves. Now, again, the Most High has concealed the matter of the calendar for so long, for so many generations, and even with us tr- having us go on multiple different calendars trying to get it right. And again, I mentioned earlier how people say, oh, if you're not on the right calendar, you can't be saved, or the Most High is going to come back on a feast day, or you got to be on the right calendar to know it. The scriptures don't say that. Yes, we're supposed to try and find it as best we can, but the Most High is concealing it for a reason, and His thoughts and His ways are higher than ours, so we're not supposed to know why it's been concealed from us. We are supposed to do our best to find it, and that's why I'm putting all this information out so that you can look into it and learn for yourself, Most High willing. But there could be some reason, there is some reason why the Most High has concealed this matter and made it really hard for us, and there could be some reason. And I want to point out something else that I haven't seen people point out with regard to the calendars. In Revelation 21, starting at line 23, And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of Elohim did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Line 24, and the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor it, right? So it's interesting how in the New Jerusalem, it says the city had no need for the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of Elohim did light in it, and the Lamb is the light thereof, and the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. So... You know what I'm saying? This earth, this physical earth is passing away. Eventually, there's going to be a new Jerusalem, new heaven, restored earth, restored heaven. And in the new Jerusalem, there's no need of the sun, no need of the moon. So maybe that's why the Most High is concealing this matter, because he knows in the new Jerusalem, in the kingdom, there is going to be no need for the sun, no need for the moon. And the glory of Elohim is going to lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. So I just wanted to point that out there. Keep that scripture in mind. Again, that's in Revelation. Really important. So think about that. Discern that. Discern everything in this episode. Do the research for yourself. Look into it. Learn. Ask the Most High. And Yah willing, He will give you understanding. All praise and glory to the Father, Yahuwah, in the name of His Son, Yahusha. Praise Yah. Hallelujah. Thank you for listening to this long episode, my beloved. I wanted to put a lot of these points in there. If you're listening on YouTube, check out the links in the YouTube video description for links to my podcast. If you have any questions, drop a comment on the YouTube video and I'll help you as best that I can. You can email the show if you're listening to the podcast. You can email the show at pod.tpr at gmail.com or anyone if you want to send me an email, you can email me pod.tpr at gmail.com. My Instagram is Wilson Ryan underscore underscore. My Twitter is Ryan Michael 11. And... I think that's everything for this episode. As the outro music, uh, on YouTube, there will be no intro or outro music. But for those listening on my podcast, for the outro music, I'm going to play the song Feast Days by Dirac Ibar. Dirac is my favorite truth music artist. I'm going to play Feast Days by Dirac Ibar to get you thinking more about the calendar, thinking about the feast days, and to try and motivate your spirit to keep looking into this and keep learning and keep discerning. Feast Days is actually, I think, the first song by Dirac Ibar that I ever heard. It's a banger. It's a great one. Dirac is a great artist. Check out his music, Dirac Ibar. And this is going to be Feast Days by Dirac Ibar. Much love to you, my beloved. Stay strong. Stay in the scriptures. Keep reading. Keep learning. Keep discerning. Stay humble. But be bold and don't be afraid to speak the truth and to research matters for yourself and share the information that you find. And we have to remember that we're all on this walk together. We're all on the same team. So we have to be brethren. Iron sharpens iron. We have to motivate each other, help each other learn and rebuke each other and open open rebuke is better than secret love and we have to do all these things in order to find the truth glory to the most high praise yahuwah elohai the righteous the father the only elohim praise adonai yahusha hamashiach the righteous the only adonai 
All glory to Yah in the highest. Hallelujah. Praise Yah. Much love. I'm going to catch you next time. Most high willing. Thanks for listening. Peace, blessings, faith, and love. And here's Feast Days by Dirac Ibar. Love.